Good morning, good uh, afternoon to some people, good evening to others. My name is Constantine Macris, and I'm going to be um, presenting the Evolve Security Intro to Cyber Threat Hunting. Uh, right now, I'm looking at the participant list, and it looks like we have 32 attendees, so that's amazing. Really excited to spend the next couple hours with you guys. As you can see, we have a Zoom webinar platform. So uh, this provides a couple means of communicating back and forth. Because there are so many participants, it's probably not going to be open chat, but you, we can enable attendees to ask questions or the question answer functionality. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. It'll say Q&A. I believe. And then also there's a chat function. I'll bring that into the window. What you probably want to do is switch to all panelists and attendees. If you just want to speak with the panelists, you can select that and that can go directly to myself. And if you have comments, questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. Okay. So this is the chat box and you'll be able to select the chat and go to, again, all panelists and attendees or just panelists. So right now I put 22 in there, <laughs> that's a mistake. So feel free to test that out. I'll be keeping track of that. I looked over the roster of people that were joining and I'm, I'm so impressed and humbled with the attendees here. I'm excited to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about threat hunting as well as to learn from, you know, what all the professionals in this room are doing. I think that as a basis, this is a difficult topic only because a lot of people don't really understand the difference between threat hunting and incident response or, you know, what, what's a SOC and what's threat hunting. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. What, what I've aimed to do is we're, we're titling this intro to threat hunting. So I'm trying to canvas from a very high level strategic kind of conversation that's going to be more focused on the, the CISO level, the management level, how you kind of build a threat hunting program, and then kind of move down from there into kind of some operational tools that you can use. I'm trying to stick with open platforms, open source tools, stuff that's um, easily available free. So I'll be referencing some GitHub pages some GitHub tools. Um, I have some demos planned. So we'll be working through a lot of that stuff. And then also getting down to the usage of some of those tools. I'm going to touch on them and leave it to you guys to kind of play around a little bit more. If it looks uh, like it's getting hot. I am in the attic of a house built in the 1850s. So it, it uh, does tend to get a little hot up here. But so right now, feel free to you know, get comfortable. I'm going to be putting a poll out here. Will you be getting a slide deck at the end of the session? I believe that will be made available. And I think that that will be able to send out a link to the slide deck. And I believe there is a recording going on right now. So for people that are, um, we saw, I saw we had some European people attending. Uh, so it's getting a little bit late or will be getting a little bit late. The later, you know, it gets, feel free to drop off and the recording will be made available. Thank you for the question. And that seems to be working well. On the same note, I'm launching a poll that allows people to pretty much give me an idea of what level you guys are at. If you're hands on keyboard, tactical um, practitioner, if you're somewhere that's working, you know, management strategy, or you're somewhere in the middle. I see some, some replies coming in here. So I'm not sure if this is uh, live for you guys, but I can pull it up here and we can see. And these are, these are, these are anonymous. So as we move on to like, what level do you think you guys are, you know, like uh, it is anonymous. So I'm seeing that we have a pretty good mix of people. So that's great. Really excited to kind of move the discussion into the areas that fit kind of the composition of the group. So without further ado, a little bit about me. My name's uh, Constantine. I go by Dean uh, Macris. I live in Connecticut. I work my day job at the United States Coast Guard Academy as an instructor of cyber systems. I teach pretty much the technical aspects of the cyber systems major, develop curriculum with them, 
I've been there for about a year, and I also continue work as a consultant and as a responder, and still are uh, in the Navy as a reservist. I've served multiple roles uh, in that position. From there, I've I've been in um, everything from again, kind of that strategic level, um, advising flag officers as to how to understand risk, all the way down to working and developing tools, um, techniques, and procedures. So. I have a little bit of experience with the Navy. I've done consulting, incident response as a consultant. And uh, now, you know what they say, those who can do, which is uh, what you guys are, and those who can't teach. <laughs> so we are um, you know, moving towards that. Go Bears, thank you, yes, for the Coast Guard. And if you um, are interested, I did graduate my undergraduate from the United States Merchant Marine Academy. So go salty the sea eagle in that case. So bears and salty. So if there's any questions for me, uh, background, I started my career um, as a merchant mariner for uh, almost a decade. I sailed commercially. I have a pretty strong background in operational technology. So I uh, kind of joked that, you know, in the early 2000s, I was maritime cybersecurity before there was maritime cybersecurity. And now um, there's a new focus on critical infrastructure and security. So one of my projects um, with the Coast Guard is working to develop kind of that operational technology curriculum and training platforms, um, both for the fleet and for the academy. So my, my pivot now is moving less towards small, medium-sized business uh, threat hunting incident response and more towards that operational technology platform. That's enough about me. If you guys have any specific questions, my contact informa information is in the slide. Uh, there's not too many Constantine macroses, so you should be able to find me. Feel free to reach out. Feel free to connect on um, LinkedIn. I'm very interested to, again, keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening in industry. I feel like that's um, something that makes me useful. That is, uh, I guess, a good, a good background on me. I live a pretty boring life here in a little podunk town in Connecticut. Starting out, we're going to talk about kind of some of the challenges of security and um, what, when we start moving into threat hunting, what the challenges are. So um, I'm going to have some questions on kind of where we feel uh, our organizations are kind of in this kind of maturity construct. And then um, where does threat hunting actually fit in? What, what is threat hunting? We're going to move into that. What is threat hunting? And then kind of that conversation of, you know, is, is this something we should be doing? Is this something that our organization should be doing and if we're not doing we're negligent and then from there we're going to start again kind of come coming in that big funnel of like strategic thinking and then start moving down into more of the operational and tactical so what do we hunt for how do we hunt and then kind of culminate and bring it all together should we be hunting we've taken the moment you know uh last hour we've kind of talked about what threat hunting is and kind of the, the theory behind it and the kind of you know work that the individuals that are going to be doing threat hunting are going to be doing what we're going to have to sell to management because it's an investment right like there's an investment in in, in some sort of capital human like we said should we be doing it the m trends from mandy at FireEye is you know puts out an annual report and here we're looking at the median dwell time. In 2018, 71 days. And this is for the Americas, right? And, and in their report, they have, um, I know we have people from all over the world. So uh, in their report, if you download it, you can go and look at the, your region and, and how they differ. And we have some data that looks like it's, it's somewhat trending downwards. There's some anomalous activity, not anomalous, it was out of the norm where even though it decreased from 2017 to 2020, it looks like the, you know, the external notification dwell time increased, but the actual average, because the average of the two decreased, um, it was marked as decreasing. So it's important to look at this sort of data, but the, the important thing isn't that it was, you know, 71 days versus 60 days or, you know, like Delta, you know, 11 days there it's like that's a lot of time right for for waiting you know to find out that you've been compromised so 
we want to take that and and make it much much less right and we don't want to give adversaries the advantage of being in the environment for that long i mean a lot of times when we're talking about this with with colleagues especially we move into uh, different organizations we bet that the adversary has a better handle on operating the network and the you know the ins and outs of it than than those that are doing it and that's because they have been there so long <laughs> they put so much energy into fingerprinting and enumerating and learning how things are because you, you have to know that in order to be an adversary so we we do need to keep this in mind that we need to look for more than what's what's known uh, again we, we we do realize that everyone is busy but we want to make sure that we are are listening for what happens in the noise so you have antivirus you've got your edr um this is from the CrowdStrike 2020 threat report, which we'll, uh, I'll probably pull up a little bit later. They've got great cartoony names and stuff. It's really, I find it much easier to remember threat actors based on their cartoony names. But we're seeing this trend from 18, again, this is backwards from the way I would read it, but from 18 to 19, we're seeing a move from, you know, file mail malware to fileless malware, right? That means that it's not just like, you know, memory forensics. It's that a lot of the adversaries are living off the land. And uh, when I say living off the land, I mean that they're using tools that are already installed on the system, whether it's uh, PowerShell, WMI, things like that. So they don't need malware. They can navigate and do uh, what they need to do using the tools that are already there. They dump credentials. They're able to elevate and they, they can do what they need to do. So we need to be looking for things that are not already there, things that are more than like just signature uh, anomaly base. So can we do it? So most importantly, and what we talk about with our our levels of kind of why I asked the question of levels of of, of interaction here, we've got some, some strategic thinkers, right? Some leaders and managers in here, and we've got some, some uh, tactical uh, hands-on keyboard operators. What we need to make sure is that we maintain, we get, so we, we solicit and maintain management buy-in. So very important that management understands what you're doing, which is why we have measurable goals. That's why we have a process. That's why we have a little you know, thing, a, a word art or whatever we call it, the, the power, <laughs> PowerPoint art that shows the cycle. So you need management buy-in. I think that would be probably the most important thing. With most cybersecurity projects, I think most people in this organization would agree that it is um, very important. We, we need the people. We need the talent. I think that's very important. And then we also um, you know, need time. Like I said, it's not a tool. You don't need to necessarily like have a, a huge budget, but you do need to budget Time. Time is, you know, clearly you're like someone needs to pay the individuals that are gonna be doing this. And you have to be able to have a certain degree of tooling and insight into the environment. You can't say that we're gonna start from, you know, if you don't have a centralized log logging or you don't have a solid method of you know remote management, uh, it's gonna be harder because you have to kind of set that up beforehand. And a lot of those things might cost money, depending on how they're implemented. You know, we put that off to the side because really. And, and kind of, you know, in the examples that we show, we're going to we're gonna show that you, you do just kind of need, you know, time, people, and buy-in to be able to start doing this. And you can, you can as long as, even if it's like you, you dedicate a day every other week, like there are ways that you can ease yourself into a threat hunting program without saying we need five people full time. You could, um, you know, get some specific training and for some people on your team, or yourself, and you could break yourself off for, you know, an afternoon. You know, I usually, you know, figure that for my team, Friday afternoons are kind of a pokey time. So that was time that we, we used to um, do the things we normally wouldn't do, right? And we just blocked off time for it. And sometimes that's at the expense of, of, of other things. And that's where you, you put it in your prioritization, right? You can have a secure environment with or without threat hunting. Uh, threat hunting is another tool in your toolbox in order to obtain 
a degree of security based on your threat profile. And as going back to that beginning slide, it differs. Every organization is different. Every, every organization's threat profile is different. Every organization's risk appetite is different. So when you take that into account, you, you take these three legs of the stool, as it were, you know, three-legged stool. And if you have people that want to do it and want to get better at it, that's usually the most important thing. And that's the thing I've learned about security overall is if you want to improve, the resources are out there and you'll be able to. You need to have that top cover. I usually um, communicate to CISOs that their job is to be a shield, right? Like the Spartan 300s with the arrows, you know, shield. But imagine that you're not protecting yourself, but you're protecting everyone under them from anything that's going on. And if you have that management buy-in, you have that top cover, then uh, your teams are able to accomplish great things. And then um, you, you have to have a degree of patience because if you're just starting out a hunt, there's going to be a lot, of, um, a lot of learning curves in the sense that you're going to um, need to work around the fact that many times you'll, you'll just come up with you know, some recommendations on how to improve things. And a lot of times the IT team will be like, yeah, we know. Yeah, we know. We know we need to do that. We knew about that, right? And then sometimes you have to, again, put it on that different hat of like your, your, you know, your IT, IT team facilitator. You need to help, help move that in the right direction. What do we hunt for? So we've got a couple avenues to gather information. We looked at the CIS top 20, right? I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with OWASP and uh, some of their controls. You have things that management is concerned about, like, and I've gotten this, and this is, again, like a lot of people are like, well, the board's worried about, because they saw it on the internet today, that everyone was getting the maze, right? You have management concerns, and I think a lot of times it's valid, because you should have to, things are, that get to the news, we should have good answers for if we're vulnerable to them or not, right? You know, we, we should be able to say, yes, we're working on it. We're vulnerable to this thing. And this is the, the date we know about it. Or, yeah, we ran it. We checked it. And we're going to keep tracking on it. You know, it's, it's built into a system that we have. So, like, management concerns are boards should get answers, right? Like, I, I think I'm, I'm a, you know, strong believer, um, you know, been on a couple boards. And boards like to get answers. Boards like to... Um, you know, be, be essentially, I mean, anyone that's dealt with them, they know they like to be catered to. So you have information you already know, right? Like if you, a lot of organizations you come in, they may not have a scene, they may not have centralized logging, they may not have a robust lessons learned program. We talk, we touch, I think it was a slide, lessons learned. It's very important to develop some sort of wiki or some sort of catalog of lessons learned. But even if you don't have that, once one IT team that was involved in a breach had a number of um, tickets that they had developed and you're able to essentially piece together all of the breach history and start get, gathering some intelligence as to how are these people getting housed all the time. And you can see like through the tickets and the documentation that way. So a lot of data manipulation there. And if we go back again, we go back, you know, kind of the, the dead horse, but you get a lot of data and you need to be comfortable sifting through the data. And we're going to talk a little bit more at the end as we get down, we filter down to the tactical, some of those, those tactical tools that we can use for that. And, and I'm assuming you guys already know, if you, you know them, your splunks, your elastic searches, right? But you, you also want to work through and hunt for things that you identify in threat model. And we'll go through, you know, briefly touch on threat modeling. And we'll do a demo on this. The light blue means we're going to do some, some demos on them. You're going to want to look at the MITRE ATT&CK framework, right? And you're going to want to utilize the external threat intelligence and uh, internal threat intelligence. So when we say external threat intelligence, we're meaning um, things like the uh, CrowdStrike Threat Intel, your reports on advanced persistent threats, APTs. And when we talk about internal threat intelligence, uh, at a certain size, and some of your organizations very well may have this, you're going to have uh, dedicated assets that are developing uh, intelligence report based on your particular organization, your industry. So industry groups are a good resource for 
somewhere between internal and external threat intelligence, right? So if you know you're, um, you know, in a power plant and you know that power grids are being um, exploited a certain way and your industry group might be able to provide you with some better intelligence. Um, you can work with um, a lot of your national counterparts that can provide you intelligence assets from there. So we use these to develop hypotheses on what to actually look for. When we're talking about intelligence, you'll see this is, you know, an advanced persistent threat report for APT 37. Uh, FireEye numbers them, CrowdStrike names them with cutesy names and cartoony figures. But intelligence essentially provides you with a story versus reputation data. In this case, we're just kind of showing like a domain blacklist, right? That is, you know, it shows you only a list, right? And the list, you don't know if this one is much worse than that one, right? Like everything on this list, you just consider it to be bad. Is it the most bad? We don't know, right? Whereas the intelligence report may not be something that you can load in to your scene, right? Like you can't take an intel report and put it in your firewall. You can't, it's a report. And a lot of what's in the report, you know, the fire eyes and the crowd strikes of the world are trying to build that into their tool to make it better. But the information you gather from this, we talk about reading between the lines, you'll be able to develop kind of this, this model for what these threat actors are doing. And we talk about like the intelligence is telling a story, it's conveying a narrative, right? The report here is going to empower decision makers. This is something, if you're reading these threat reports, you're digesting them and you're internalizing them, you can then go to you know, the decision makers above you and explain the story, right? Show them who these people are, right? That you're worried about and why you're worried about. It. And this is a cycle where a lot of people think, oh, this could never happen to us, right? This is, you know, but as you start looking, you'll start finding that whether it's APT 37 or someone that's using similar TTPs, there is probing going on all the time. Um, as part of a project I was working on, I set up uh, a honeypot in, where was it, India, I believe, for no other reason other than, you know, to show that you could spin up a server anywhere um, as an educational value. But we were getting pretty bummed because it seemed like we were just getting about, you know, like 1,500, 2,000, you know, attacks on whatever it was. And it seemed to get up to that and just kind of stay there. And I'm sitting there with the class and I'm like, yeah, I, I've done this before. And at that point, I looked and I realized we were only looking at the last like five minutes, like or whatever the default was, 15 minutes, I think, on the Elasticsearch um, uh, Kibana um, dashboard. So we looked at the total and it was like millions and millions. And, you know, you saw like the Cisco exploits, you saw, you know, the, the, the all the you know, vulnerable services just getting hammered all the time. And we then took all that data back where we were able to play with it, parse it, so on and so forth. But I, again, this is kind of the, the analogy that I like to use is that a lot of times it's just your, your Cheerio that's on the floor. Like you're, you know, take a handful of Cheerios, throw them on the floor, right? And then start your Roomba, right? Or whatever. I have a Eufy. I've got like the off-brand Roomba. You could find that you wake up the next day or whenever if it runs at night and there's still Cheerios on the floor. So like your adversary, the Roomba, didn't hit all the Cheerios that night, right? Like, but eventually, like you might find where there's one Cheerio that's in a place that the you know, Roomba has a real hard time reaching, right? It's like in a corner, it needs to get a little sweeper to get the sweeper out, right? But eventually, you know, you very well might be that Cheerio that gets sucked up that day, right? The problem is that we don't think we can be that Cheerio, right? A lot of times, in small, medium-sized businesses at least, large businesses, I think, have a better handle on, um, on understanding this risk and threat. But you know, to be able to convey this, you have a story now. And this external threat intelligence through these APT reports um, is a great resource. And you know, from APT1 to now, um, when it was released by FireEye, we've seen this become the standard of how we're going to tell this story. So we're developing intelligence through a couple processes. Like we have collection, um, we have this kind of analysis section, right? Where we have models and humans. 
And then we actually have outputs. And those outputs are things like, you know, your intelligence feed, things like the SANS um, Internet Storm Center, if you're uh, not tracked on that. Um, again, I'm assuming that most people um, are, are doing a lot of these. Like I said, I, I'm so humbled and impressed with all of the attendees here. And if, if I'm missing the level that you expected, I do apologize because I'm trying to take a top-down approach now. But you'll have threat reports, the, the ATP report, uh, reports. We'll have um, issued countermeasures, right? So patches and tools and mitigations. You'll have uh, outputs being like um, alarms that get um, loaded into the various tools that you have. You'll have trends that are tracking these TTPs. TTPs are techniques, um, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And I apologize for the acronyms. Again, it's an unintended consequence of being associated with, um, you know, some of these organizations like the Navy. And then we talked about kind of these in industry intel channels. So like, for instance, industrial controls, those operators, those OT operators, um, all get together every year, an organization uh, called Dragos, a great bunch of people. They bring together all the industry security professionals and they don't let anyone else in and they will discuss their no, no, you know, no holds barred, uh, essentially what happened that year. And they get um, an area where they can discuss it in a, a safe place where they don't need to worry about being judged and they don't need to worry about, you know, essentially ending up on the front page of the New York Post, which, you know, as a, as a vessel operator was always, you know, you don't want to be on the cover of the newspaper, right? It's, it's important that you, you have that support network because if we're not talking about it with each other, right, then we end up not talking about it. And we don't talk about lessons learned and um, we don't share the intelligence. Now, there's a flip side to that coin in that we are unable to learn from those things if they're, they're, not, they're not made um, you know, public. So the industry intel channel seems to be kind of a happy medium between sharing information and making it public.